$120,000 in Bitcoin was recently stolen from a Twitter scan with blue checkmark verified accounts. It's already too late to get your money back this time, but what can you do to make sure that it doesn't happen to you moving forward? We're going to run down the checklist for you. This is the most excitement we've seen in cryptocurrency in a while, right? People actually stealing large sums of money, but relative to Twitter, a lot of people are questioning like, mm, you know, if you hack Twitter, is $120,000 worth it as a black hat hacker? Well, you know, I could jump down that rabbit hole and we get really, really lost. Um, to stay focused though, let me pull up that money that you mentioned was gone, Nicole. I'm going to pull mm -hmm. it up on blockchain.com so we can take a look at those wallets, the addresses where the money was filtered to, the crypto uh, in Bitcoin was filtered to. The first one is the address ending in WLH. And that one contained, or at, at its peak, contained 12.8 Bitcoin, roughly, give or take. And today, this wasn't the case even 48 hours ago, but today it only contains dust, um, less than one full Bitcoin, far less than even a quarter of a Bitcoin or even a tenth of a Bitcoin. Is It's been totally drained. And I think when we were live tweeting it during the hack, during the event, they had, uh, I think, tumbled about half of the contents of that wallet. They just got rid of it. Um, some others have said, well, maybe some of the accounts that were associated with the the draining or, or the rinsing, the, the flushing, if you will, of that of that wallet, um, that there some of them were associated with Coinbase and, and BitPay and other accounts that could be shut down. For some people, this brings up questions of decentralization and sovereignty, not your keys, not your crypto, yada, yada. But the bottom line is the hackers, the addresses that they advertised are now empty. So there's the one, here's the other, uh, and let's see, what does it end in? It's actually too long to list here, uh, but the alternate address, I think that was used by the, that they uh, broadcast on Kim Kardashian's account, for example, and Kanye West's account, among others, I think uh, Elon Musk's as well, that it only had about half a Bitcoin at its peak. That's now drained as well. So all that money gone irretrievably tons and so this was a really big i mean it was a big deal that they had so many high profile politicians tech figures and celebrities i mean because it wasn't just and one thing that none of the articles on this topic have mentioned so it's really worth you know worth mentioning is that the first account that posted this um i don't know statement wasn't a blue check mark verified account it was a crypto account and it belonged to angelo btc Wow. Okay. Yeah. Angelo, Angelo BTC. I'm not very familiar with their work. Who is Angelo BTC? Uh, for what I, I do follow him, but not real closely. So from what I understand, he's just a, you know, successful trader. Okay. Wow. That's, that is a very interesting place to start. Um, yeah. So it was strange because yeah, then, you know, then we started seeing those identical text posts from accounts like Joe Biden and Elon Musk. And, you know, and then what was even crazier was that Twitter deleted those comments and the hacker was still able to access those people's accounts. So they reposted with slightly different wording again. That's unreal. So I've heard some rumors that it was an internal hack. I've heard some people say that there's some kind of a, a hidden God mode within the administrative side of Twitter and that the hacker was able to successfully co-opt that, that air quotes, God mode and just do whatever they wanted. And, um, it was just scary. It was scary to see so many, uh, so many people in not like you're mentioning, not only in the crypto sphere or with blue check marks, but people who are politicians, the former president of the United States, Barack Obama was hacked. Yes. I mean, uh, the, I think the, uh, what I read was the only thing that kept Donald Trump's account from being hacked is that there are additional safeguards put in place by Twitter for precisely this sort of thing. So it's well, not his, attack, his, his account was apparently hacked and deleted in previously. So they, Twitter was able to restore the account, but because there was a, because of that previous hack, they had taken extra measures, um, to protect that account. It really wasn't because the white house inherently does these extra things to protect the president. It was because they've had, they've experienced similar tech issues. That makes sense that the president of the United States, that the, the current president elect would be a high value target in terms of being able to hack social media accounts and especially with Twitter. I mean, this is the full replacement for newspapers in 2020. I mean, full stop. Do you get news anywhere else? No. I mean, if I go looking for it, but. <laughs> right. It's, it's always a day late and literally a dollar short or a Bitcoin short today. I mean, got to change, revise the phrase, right? Revise that old, that old quote. Yeah. But uh, so we've got the list and let me ask you the, the first one. 
bombastic claims? Did the hackers, when they posted this message, did they offer a bombastic claim? Yeah, absolutely. So send me Bitcoin and I'll send you double your Bitcoin back because I'm feeling generous. I mean, right. Because, uh, yeah, because pe- the people who were posting this, you know, some of them weren't even known to be into cryptocurrency. So that would mean that they were holding, you know, large sums of crypto without having acknowledged it. So not only is it absurd in terms of the amount of crypto that one would have to be holding to make that come true, but doubling your money just for sending money somewhere is absolutely a bombastic claim. Yeah, you're going to get twice back. I mean, why would anybody do that? I don't know, but... But but, but, but it's Joe Biden offering, surely. he. It's <laughs> Joe Biden, it's Elon Musk. It's people who, yeah... Yeah, someone who you can trust, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, did they make bombastic claims? Yes. Um, <laughs> the second point is: is there a multi-level or multi-tier marketing system in place, like a pyramid scheme? Well, no, no. The hackers they didn't think that far ahead. They didn't set up any kind of a, a tiered referral system. Hey, refer your friends to give me Bitcoin, and I'll double theirs and give you more. Maybe if they did, they would have gotten more than twelve and a half Bitcoin. Maybe. Maybe. But they did not offer that. So that that didn't happen. Can it be traded on exchanges? Well, the Bitcoin that you sent to a hacker, can that be traded on exchanges by you? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, so Bitcoin <laughs> can be traded on exchanges or used in commerce, right? But yeah. Um, yeah. Some of the points really don't really don't work out that well because yeah. of. Yeah. Because. Yeah, they- yeah, they don't map one to one for sure. This mm-hmm. this list, the thing that I like about it is that it still can be useful and instructive for anybody else. Um, as far as somebody who did ask you to send them Bitcoin and then they offered you double in exchange, is that sort of a thing legal in the United States? Would that be a red flag for somebody if they just looked at this list and said, well, I don't even know if that's legal for somebody to just say that on a Twitter post. Yeah. Would it be legal? Sure. I mean, I don't see how just saying that you're going to return some, you know, double someone's Bitcoin holdings is illegal. I don't see any world where that could potentially be illegal, particularly not in a place where free speech is allowed. But I guess that's where it gets into, you know, should we really have dangerous freedom, right? Like, or or is this the point where freedom becomes dangerous? And if so, what can be done to dial it back? I don't think anything. I don't think that there's anything that you can do about the possibility for someone somewhere someday saying on social media or elsewhere that they're going to double your Bitcoin or double your investment. I don't think that there's anything that can be done about that. There you go. So whether it's legal or not, it just is what it is. Let's talk about real experts endorsing anything even remotely resembling this. Has anyone historically ever endorsed something like this where they just post an address and say, send me any crypto and I'll double it back to you? Not that I know of, but I could see it being argued that, you know, reputable experts were endorsing Bitcoin or were endorsing cryptocurrency or were endorsing this idea because it was multiple people posting at, you know, around the same time. So, I mean, I could see this point kind of going either way. Nobody reputable that I'm aware of sent Bitcoin to those, you know, to those addresses, but that doesn't mean that nobody reputable appeared to be promoting the concept. Okay, there there you go. So yeah, a bit of a mixed bag there. This could be confusing for that reason, guys, as, as a scam. As far as it being marketed to the ignorant, again, on this checklist, pretty important to acknowledge you would have to be ignorant to fall for something like this. Yes. Yes. It was marketed to the ignorant. But at the same time, you would also have to be sophisticated enough to know how to send Bitcoin. Yeah. But with Coinbase or, you know, cash app or whatever, allowing you to buy directly from your phone, from your bank account, from your debit card, you know, wouldn't have been that hard for someone to figure out. Okay. Fair point. Uh, (laughs) Who's on the team? We don't know yet. Um, yeah. <laughs> as far as the, the rest of the checklist, uh, founder claims proven to be false, totally not applicable. Um, other than that, anybody who posted this on Twitter has immediately recanted or when they got control of their account, the first thing they did was say, hey, either if they're totally not into crypto was assure their audience, look, I've never been into crypto. I never would ask this of you. So uh, this would be maybe evidence that claims that were made from these accounts, obviously proven to be false because the rightful owners went back to set the record straight. So um, 
Yeah, and this should be evidence that anything that resembles something like this, like send us so much crypto and we'll give you so much back, that in the future, that sort of a claim just can't be trusted, categorically can't be trusted. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm sorry, I don't have the checklist in front of me. That's kind of why you're running down all the questions. But I don't know, maybe is it okay to mention this? Because this is a big deal for me. My account was compromised <laughs> with the other, with the other. And you can vouch for this, right? Because yeah. I sent you a screenshot. My account was frozen with the blue check mark accounts when Twitter got a hold of, you know, once Twitter got in control of the hack and they shut down all of the accounts and i was so proud of myself <laughs> <laughs> it was it was quite a moment i gotta be honest and and i mean i laughed i thought i was laughing with you at first because i thought you were i thought you were joshing me right i thought you were saying like oh yeah check it out but at the same time it, they literally did shut down your ability to post because of your connection to politics and crypto so yep totally yep. And, I mean, it was like it was I, I was laughing because it was funny, but I was like, my name is on a name with like these <laughs> it's like I'm special. Like I finally <laughs> I finally like, yeah, I mean, I've got enough like influence, I guess, with, that, you know, somebody would want to potentially hack my account, which is both scary and cool. Yeah, totally. Well, let's talk a little bit about that as far as the risks of these platforms, as far as what the implications are of a hack like this. Um, let's talk about that on the long tail of this very special episode of Scam Buster Saturday. It seems like so many of our episodes lately are kind of like different. Yeah. Right? But yeah. But I think that there's there's more to the story, right? Like you're saying, uh, you could be a casualty of a scam like this and not even be directly affected, but indirectly have there be weird knock on effects that mess with your life. So uh, important to be aware of this sort of thing. Uh, but I do have the checklist ahead of me. Let's just quickly disqualify some of these things, uh -huh. I'm mentioning them and see what does apply, what doesn't apply. Is there a functioning product? Well, no. I mean, no, yeah, no. <laughs> they, they offered nothing. They, off they offered merely a return on you sending them something, which is, yeah, not a product. Yep. Um, yeah, so it, it's, Though I will say that bears resemblance to some offers within the crypto sphere. And it's what made the SEC so hesitant about ICOs in 2017 and 2018, because it sounded like this to them. They said, oh, you're dealing in securities and you're, you're promising something, but do you have you made anything yet? So, right. Yep. Uh, not the same, though. No, not the and same at all. GitHub activity, none. Can't do that. Mm -hmm. Smart contract, there wasn't one. Well, we kind of did the rough equivalent of this at the very beginning when you showed the blockchain explorer, right? So, and another thing about this that I think we could mention could be potentially helpful in case anything like this ever occurs again, and you're trying to decide if you want to send your Bitcoin or not, right? Um, would be to look at the addresses. So if, you know, you know, Elon Musk and Joe Biden and Kim Kardashian and Kanye West all post the same Bitcoin address that they want you to send Bitcoin to. Well, what are the odds that those people are really sharing a wallet? Yeah, yeah. For anybody who understands even the most fundamental aspects of cryptocurrency, not bloody likely. Yeah, they're not going to be using the same crypto address of any cryptocurrency unless it's some kind of a donation address that they're promoting on behalf of a third party organization, like a charity or something, maybe. Right, but then there wouldn't be promises of return. Precisely, precisely. Mm -hmm. So there'd be very specific conditions met before a group, a collection of people like this all promote the same crypto address. Um, so that brings to the last point of the underscoring point of people listening to their gut to keep from getting scammed. We saw that enough people were, they were duped by this that over 12 Bitcoin, almost 13 Bitcoin, no, 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 a little more than 13 Bitcoin in total were scammed from people. So what is wrong with these people's gut? Like what's wrong with their instinct? Why would people fall for this? Greed. I mean, greed, desperation. I think that those are probably the primary motivators, right? I mean, I could get double my Bitcoin. I could double my money, um, especially people who are maybe new to the crypto space and bought in, you know, maybe bought in high, probably not people who bought in, you know, 2017 bought the high, like, because by now those people have either left or become very committed to the space. <laughs> it's true, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, um, they become the hodlers of last resort. Like, okay, yeah. this better go back up. Yeah. But so, uh, you know, why I, I think 
the potential to double your holdings really quickly, right? I mean, I, I think, yeah, greed and desperation are the only real motivators here. Okay, there, there you go. So yeah, take, take, a, take a good look in the mirror, folks. If your only motivators are greed and desperation, got to retrain your gut. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So aside from all this, then we've gone through the checklist and this would normally apply to any other kind of a project where you ask yourself, is this crypto project a scam? And I've actually, as the graphic, I've used our t-shirt from the mindyear.biz store designed by uh, nerd girl and myself here, the checklist, uh, of course, by, by nerd girl developed by nerd girl. And in the past, I think Tim Pichot as well assisted significantly to this, uh, to this checklist. And then the little, little thinking guy and the Bitcoin logo mm -hmm. that's on mindyear.biz today. You can wear it every single day to help other people stay safe. Um, so we've gone through that to see what is relevant and what isn't to a project like this. Let's talk about the potential ramifications of hacks like this. And let's help people really be armed, not only to avoid being scammed by projects like this, but to figure out how do I secure myself from large scale hacks? I don't know. Well, those are two separate questions. Um, so first off, let me ask you, Nicole, what do you think people can do to just be smarter about scams like this? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, it comes down to initially why would somebody offer this? And if there's no potential motivation for them, like it's not someone doing a, you know, a giveaway on Twitter to gain followers or to gain, you know, clout or to get retweeted, you know, whatever it is, why would someone do that? Um, I mean, again, greed, right? Like what, what would the other, I, I guess, trying to look at things as if you are the person who's doing the giveaway or running a potential scams, mo trying to figure out what their motives are. And if the only motive that you can come up with is greed, then maybe that's something that you should reevaluate. I don't know. Okay. There, there you go. So try to ask yourself that question. What, what's in it for this, this guy or gal, or what's in it for the, the actors on the other side of the scam or the screen? Right. Okay. That's a good one. It's a really good heuristic. Um, let's kind of move on though. And, and you had the experience of your Twitter account being shut down. Mm -hmm. Did you have any alternatives, any recourse? How did you reach out to people and get, get info or, and how did you interact so, when Twitter was shut down? Yeah. So I was still able to log into Twitter. I could still like, I could still DM people. And obviously I was using signal to communicate with you. That's how we always communicate. So, um, in terms of where did I post like for the, you know, five hours <laughs> my account was blocked. Well, at first I didn't post because I was, you know, and then I was like, oh, I can still, I, I, you know, post it on note. I always post on note often, probably as much or close to as much as I post on Twitter. Um, even though through, I thought that I would try posting to Twitter through note and that did, that function was also disabled um, during the hack. So, how did I find out? I posted in a group chat that I'm in. Hey, is anybody else locked out of their Twitter? Can everyone tweet? Everyone else could tweet. And I was like, you know, so then I asked you and then I got a notification from Twitter. Oh my gosh. Okay. There, there you go. Okay. So it sounds mm -hmm. like then you just had alternate communication channels for all these other things. DMs apparently hadn't been shut down for you. And yep. I read from some other places that retweets were available for many of the people whose accounts were shut down. Yeah, I did. I have another friend whose account was compromised and, um, and she, she was able to retweet, but not retweet with comment. Okay. Well, there, there you go. So they were like bumblebee piecing together phrases by retweeting other people's info. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so, and you mentioned also that note is a platform that you've been using to great advantage lately, as far as engagement and just, just the, the sort of social media, well, it's not really the same as Twitter, but as a good alternative to Twitter? Yeah, so, you know, we've done, we've covered Note previously, um, you know, quite a bit. Obviously people know we like Note, it's cool. It's not Twitter, all right? It's it's not Twitter in some great ways and it's not Twitter in some real functional ways. Like I couldn't, you know, type a message from my computer, I have to use my phone. Um, you know, you can't post anything that's over, I think two megabytes. Um, so, you know, there's some GIFs that can be posted, but no mostly can't really post videos. There's no inlay of uh, YouTube videos or anything like that. That said, it was only for a few hours. Um, you know, I've also used and have become pretty fond of Twitch. Okay. Awesome. So that's working out for you. Mm -hmm. 
great. Yeah, for me, I tried Twitch. I couldn't get into it. It just there were a couple things that were a non-starter for me. I like in theory the um, I like in theory the microtransaction value of working within a cryptocurrency and having to pay to play so you keep bad actors or bad faith actors out of the space, or if they do enter the space, you charge them right for their bad actions. Um, but that was a bit of a non-starter for me because I'm not really I'm not really a bag holder of BSV, so I didn't really have a good starting point, right? I didn't even have dust of BSV right now. So nobody sent you a bunch of BSV when you first got there? I want to say the developers offered to, and I, I just didn't get deep enough into it to uh, to accept, right? To take them up on that. Mm-hmm. So, so and by that. a bunch, I mean like $5 worth. Because right? yeah. <laughs> like, that's about like what you need to like, you know, post and, you know, do everything that you would want to like, yeah, really get started. Yeah, no, I, I just didn't get that far. And it's it, this is not me casting shade on the development team or on the community at all. This is just me saying no. I didn't get to that point. So yeah, though there were some people who have also been onboarded into the Twitch ecosystem. Uh, Fomobi is one uh, who was mm-hmm. very bullish on Twitch until he just yep. stepped away. And then- No, he still is. Uh, we were just having a conversation about how much he enjoys the platform. Oh, got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. He's just not as public about it on Twitter, I should say. He's not, he's not advocating for it strongly. So- Yeah, yeah, maybe. But I think, you know, I think- and maybe you have to pick one social media platform to really, really promote. And, you know, no, of course. Yeah, got it. I, mm-hmm. I love the ephemeral messaging capability of, uh, of Note. And with, with the Twitch app as an alternative to Twitter, something that is kind of fraught with danger within the cryptocurrency and blockchain social media space is the idea that you could post something on an immutable ledger and never be able to edit, never be able to delete, never see it disappear. Maybe your attitude or opinion changes. Maybe something about your circumstances change and you just want certain posts to be gone or altered. Not not possible on Twitch, as I understand it. Yeah, I think that kind of the idea behind that is, though, that people will be more thoughtful about what they post before they post, you know, just whatever random dribble. Not only because it costs, you know, five to ten cents, but because it. Uh, because your message will be there forever. And, you know, anybody at any point in time could go back and look at everything that you've ever written, you know, or posted to that blockchain. So I get kind of how it's both a positive and a negative. Um, I think that, you know, that's why I think that there's room for more than one alternative social media platform. Totally agreed. Yeah, could not possibly agree more. Uh, What I'll say in addition to that is that I think very few social media users, and this kind of dovetails into the potential risks of a hack like this, very few social media users really respect the animal, so to speak. Um, Some of our audience may or may not know that many years ago, I produced a a documentary about venomous creatures. And and I actually handled a rattlesnake once. Uh, it was it was pretty cool. I, I met up with the Sweetwater JCs who do the Sweetwater Roundup of rattlesnakes every single year out in Sweetwater, Texas, and they do it that as a as a leadership training. Uh, it's like a mentorship program that they do. It's a bit like 4H or a bit like what the Boy Scouts used to be. And um, and I had this moment. It was just really fun. Indulge me for a minute here. I had this moment with that with one of their one of their elders, I guess, in the in the Sweetwater JCs organization, and um, and they saw that I. Uh, that I just picked up a rattlesnake correctly, correctly, and uh, and respected the animal, but held it in such a way that for us to get our next shot for the documentary. And he sort of looked at me sideways and was like, "Wow, I've never seen anybody take to this quite so quickly. You you really respected the animal, and you and you, but but you weren't afraid of it." And his guys got all wild, like a like some guy from out in, in rural Texas. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was very you know I was very humbled and flattered by that, and um. But a lot of people don't respect the animal that is social media, anything that's digital, anything that turns into binary code or can be can be translated into base 64. It lives as bits and bytes forever. And um, and with Twitter, there's been some whisperings of the possibility that the hackers got away with all kinds of private DM data from the accounts that were compromised. If that's true. Then they have private DM data of Barack Obama, Joe Biden, um, the Kardashians and Kanye West, mm-hmm. and everybody else who was compromised in the political sphere, right? Political Twitter. And uh, and then, of course, crypto Twitter, which is probably less important overall right. yeah. globally. But mm-hmm. political Twitter, they got away with everybody's DMs and everything that's ever been sent or received in the DMs. Yikes. So it's a lot of leverage. I- 
Twitter had said that there was it that 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 data wasn't compromised, but of course they would say that, right? <laughs> yeah, at this point, at this point, until it's proven otherwise. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I look at that and think, okay, well, I think sometimes we're just not very cautious about where we let the internet connect our personal life. That's what I'm saying. So with DMs, if we don't know that something is absolutely end to end encrypted and secure, then it it's a bit of a risk. It's a bit of a risk. We're not really respecting the animal that is digital media. So, yeah, I, uh, yeah, they're, they're, there they're, you go. All right. Full wrapped circle. it up in a bow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and there is a tail end and there's a business end. And the tail end mm-hmm. really is meant to warn us, right? It really is meant to warn us that there's a business end. We could get bit, we could get injected, and we could, you know, metaphorically, professionally die or, you know, socially die or something. Yeah. So, uh, so with this, this hack, Thank goodness Twitter has said that that those DMs haven't been compromised. Uh, but uh, but Nicole, just like how we communicate privately on a regular basis with Signal, um, what I love about my personal world is that my wife knows this. She's not like, oh my gosh, who's that? Who's that lady that you're DMing privately? Like, yeah. <laughs> she doesn't. She's not jealous about it because we've normalized encrypted private communication in our relationship without having it be like, Oh, we're in, we're in an open relationship. Right. Um, and, uh, and I do so with all of my friends, anybody who I communicate with regularly gets that invite from me for signal where it's like, okay, yeah. cool. We can communicate publicly, but that's not secure. I respect that animal for what it is. And I could get bit someday. If we want to be, if we want to have a, a com- communicate completely openly, honestly, with no filter, it's going to be this way. So. Yeah. 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 So, or private paper, right? Exactly. Or <laughs> this Jitsi meet. If we're going to, we're going to use a, a video chat or have video conferences. Yeah. You know, we haven't fully encrypted everything correctly just yet. We have to go over that with our, our future guests. But, um, but talking about that the other day, I talked to a friend uh, about cars randomly. We talked about cars and you and I talked about this before the recording. Uh, we got on the subject of, the, the hack. And I said, yeah, I'm, that makes me worried about cars. I said, okay. Well, what do you mean? It gets you worried about cars. Well, I'm going to pull up on the screen right now. This article is almost exactly five years old today. And it was shared on wired.com or wired magazine did an article in which two hackers remotely killed a Jeep. Uh, was it Jeep Cherokee of that year? Brand new car from 2015. So it can be supposed that every car from that point forward has this same level of internet connection or the same possibility for remote hacking. In this article, the hackers fully disabled the car. They shut it down while the journalist was in the car because the journalist invited them to and said, I want you to hack the car while I'm driving it. The first thing they did was they hit the brakes remotely, fully controlled the car to that point. They could just pump the brakes remotely. At that moment, the journalist writes about it. They were on the freeway going 70 miles an hour with cars whizzing past them as they're slamming on the brakes uncontrollably. And just mentioned like, you know, my life flashed before my eyes. And that's a Jeep Cherokee from 2015. Fast, uh, flash forward to today, we've got Tesla. The main feature is that it's internet connected and can be driven fully autonomously. And what I think this hack demonstrates very clearly is that something that is as well-developed a, uh, a code base as Twitter and is as secure with whatever AES-256 encryption, like bank level encryption on their databases and on their control surfaces as Twitter is, they were just hacked. And we're driving around in vehicles that can do this same level of like internet connection and mm-hmm. with the same amount of bandwidth and, and back and forth talking to a centralized server. Why is anybody okay with this? Yeah, and there was something that you said before we were recording that's really important, right? Which was that Tesla uses the same method of encryption that Twitter does to prevent hacks. Is that correct? That's just to say that this is a standard, right? It, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so without without saying anything that could be you know uh, that could be criticized for in the future, right? Again, social media is a uh, it's, a, it's a fine fine servant, terrible master. I, I don't want to be held to, uh, accountable for this in the future. I'm not saying that they have the exact same whatever uh, DevOps topology or you know server topology as Twitter. It's just to say that best practices for containerization of code on uh, on public cloud or even on private cloud, pretty much the same across 
most uh, across most services. And so if Tesla has is running their operation even remotely the same as every other company that's that's like them and it's a very good bet that they are, then it takes somebody motivated and uh, and it takes somebody maybe with access, maybe it's there's been talk of the the Twitter hack being done internally by by some disgruntled employee or something. Mm-hmm. What would it take for Twitter to be hacked this way? And I contend probably not much, probably yeah. not much more. Yep. Yep. And I mean, most people have IoT devices in their home, even if they're not driving around in Teslas, right? I mean, the prevalence of things like Alexa or Google's Home Assistant, you know, it's all it's all connected, right? Yeah. Or smart fridges or, you know, whatever, whatever it is that's smart, right? And really, we all carry recording devices on us most of the time anyway, as long as we have cell phones. But yeah, reducing the number of those devices in your home and possession may be one way to protect yourself from being scammed. I think that's exactly right. I think it's exactly mm-hmm. right, Nicole, is that the only way to limit the attack surface is to limit the number of devices or the, the well, the, the literal attack surface, um, mm-hmm. limit the number of devices and limit your amount of time around them, limit your dependence on them, if, if at all possible. Of limiting your attack surfaces and our cell phones being these little recording devices that are going everywhere with us, I think that Mind Your Biz has a, pro- has a product that could help reducing your attack surface. Yes, we do. We have the Zero Google phone line that, uh, that are unlocked bootloader phones. I've got for show and tell right here. They even come in a plain brown box. So they're very inconspicuous. It's like ordering, you know, any other private item that comes to your, your address. It looks like a box of checks, if anybody even orders those anymore. But uh, <laughs> we've got uh, the Zero Google phones. They run in the Android open source project, but with zero Google Play Store, zero Google Play services, and zero dependence on Google, provided you only install apps that don't need it. And that's totally possible in 2020 with the F-Droid uh, app store, at least for Android, it's entirely possible to exist without Google, without Apple, without Facebook, of course, and without Netflix or Amazon. You don't have to have those services running on your phone, but you have to start with a phone that has been wiped clean and doesn't rely on them just to make phone calls and receive texts. Awesome. Awesome. So anybody who wants to pick one of those up can pick one up from Mind Your Biz. And hey, while you're there, you could also pick up a Satoshi for President shirt or one of many other designs that Seth or I or, you know, somebody else who one of us has worked closely with has designed, right? Absolutely. So I've got that page up active right now. And you got Satoshi 2020 on right now. What other? Yep, I do. Let's see. Nice. This is limited edition, right? It's going to be voting season soon, soon enough. You guys need to tell the world you're voting with uh, voting with your dollars, voting with your feet, that you're voting for crypto. Right. And, you know, one thing that I had a conversation about this just the other day, somebody was saying that it was stupid because why would you, Satoshi wasn't one person. And I said, look, I'm not really even talking about, you know, people writing in Satoshi on the ballot, though I'm not totally opposed to that idea either. Um, I mean, because what would it matter? It's really, it's a vote of no confidence, right? But like what it is, is a larger statement about, you know, voting with your dollar about the people taking control of their own money of their own you know country of whatever it is that you, you know you want to gain control over so yeah absolutely and I, I i mean we can't know for sure but i really do think that satoshi would approve yeah i think so too awesome well on that note why don't we go ahead and close the show nicole thanks so much for doing another episode of saturday scam busters on a sunday yep. <laughs> Yep, uh, Sunday scam busters, whatever. Some weeks, yeah. some weeks, some weekends, it just be like this, folks. Tomorrow night is Roger Veer on our live stream. So check that out if you, yeah, yeah. Roger Veer out. live, unfiltered, uncensored, maybe? Hmm? Maybe. Hmm? <laughs> we won't aggressively hang up if he flips us the bird. Not going to nope. happen. Not going to happen, <laughs> folks. <laughs> All right. So also remember. But at the end of the day, the only person who can prevent you from being scammed is you. See you, folks.